Hi, welcome to tonight's edition of the TD Show. Uh, my name is Chris Bird, and tonight we are joined by Bob Messenger. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Hi, doing great. Thanks. Uh, Bob is a national tournament director, uh, FIDE International Arbiter, co-chair of the U.S. Chess States and Affiliates Committee, and also you're a member of the Rules, Bylaws, Scholastic, and Senior Committees. How do you have time to do anything, Bob? <laughs> Bob, you um, well, I have plenty of time right now. It was more difficult. So, um, Bob, you um, let's find out how about how you got into tournament directing. How how did that happen? Well, around 1990, Stephen Dan was looking for someone to help him direct tournaments in Massachusetts, and so I thought that would be something different. Something I had been playing, but I hadn't been directing before. So I got into that. There was an opening on the Massachusetts Chess Association or MACA board. So I showed up at a board meeting, I think in 91, got appointed. And within a couple of years, I started running my own tournaments in New Hampshire. And I also started uh, running MACA tournaments. And so I've been. Um, now treasurer of the Massachusetts and New Hampshire Chess Association. Also, the other thing Stephen Dan did is he introduced me to Bill Goitschberg, and so I started directing at the World Open. So my first World Open was 1993, and now I'm a CCA employee, so that's kind of moved right. me along in the chess world. And you've worked for CCA ever since, I assume? Well, I, yeah, I think I was hired in 2011, something okay. like that. Before that, I was, you know, working in as a software engineer and just do part-time chess. Whereas now, I'm full-time. Okay, cool. All right. Well, for those who don't know, tonight's uh, topic is all about starting games and and in specific the clock and what should happen at the start of a game with the chess clock. Uh, you know, you got to set it, you got to put it somewhere, got to get it ready for the game, etc. So let's uh, dig into the rules and see. Uh, exactly what we're going to be talking about here. There's a lot of rules to do with uh, the clock and how it should be set up for games. So let's dig st straight into 5F1, which talks about the standard timer for increment-capable games. So if, uh, if you're having an increment time control, the standard timer for that, surprisingly, is a clock that's capable of increment. Um, so, um, and there are some options you see here uh, that say if you don't have an increment-capable cl uh, clock, um, you can use one of the following options in order of preference. So a delay capable clock. Uh, so if you're doing like uh, you know 30 second increment, uh, if you can get a delay capable clock that can be set for a 30 second delay, that's preferable over a clock that can't do 30 seconds, can say only do 20 seconds of delay, uh, which is again preferable over a digital clock that can't do any sort of delay. And then everything is preferable over an analog clock that can't do any sort of delay or increment. So uh, it's pretty seem, seems pretty simple in terms of what you need if, if it's an increment time control. And uh, moving on, setting a non-increment capable clock for use with an increment time control. So in this case, it says that um, you basically set the clock for the base time. And whatever the, uh, obviously if it's gaming 90, increment 30. Um, you set the base time for gaming 90 and then you do whatever uh, the maximum possible setting to get as close to that increment 30 as you can get. So if your clock is only capable of a 20 second delay, you'd set it to gaming 90 with a 20 second delay. If you use an analog clock or a digital clock that's not capable of increment and delay, you just set it to gaming 90. You don't make any uh, allowance for that increment 30, uh, 30 seconds that they're going to lose um, in the rest of the game. Uh, it's a fault for not bringing the correct type of clock, I guess. Uh, Bob, how many times do you run into this at CCA events? People don't have the right type of clock? It does happen um, sometimes, and we just do the best we can. I wanted to point out one thing, which is that, it, as always in U.S. chess, the uh, organizer or director can have a variation. So you, if you wanted to to be kind to these people who have analog clocks and give them some extra time. You could do that as long as you announce that. Um, 
Right. So you could turn around and say, you know, if you don't have an increment capable clock, you can set your clock to gaming 120 or something. Um, you could do that, yeah. You know, you know, let's hope everyone has the right clock. Uh, and then the next rule covers uh, what to do if it's a delay time control. So a delay cl a capable clock is a standard timer for use with delay time control, shockingly enough. Um, if the delay capable or Bronstein capable clock is not available, a uh, digital clock that is not delay capable may be used. Now, one thing I notice here is it doesn't turn around and say to us that we can use an increment capable clock if we don't have a delay capable clock. Um, I, I assume they don't want they don't want you getting the additional time uh, like you would with an increment. So I guess uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then again, the analog clock, uh, you set it for the same base time without delay. And the players don't get the delay unless the, you know there's a variation announced that, that the analog clocks are, are dealt with differently. And then uh, the next type of timer is obviously a time control that doesn't have an increment or a delay. Uh, and the stand, standard timer for such a control uh, is a digital clock. Uh, and if you can't have, find a digital clock, you can use an analog clock. Um, but that brings us into the next rule which basically says, uh, in all cases, a digital clock is preferred over an analog clock. I think this is a somewhat recent addition, surprisingly enough, to the, to the rules, maybe you know, going back only a few years, um, that the digital clock is, is now always preferred over an analog clock. You remember when that came in? Well, any ideas? I don't remember which edition of the rule book that was. I do remember it used to be, well, because the first digital clocks weren't all that great didn't really like them right. so yeah. um, I think analog was preferred over digital if you did not have the delay at some back then right. or at least yep. they're equal yeah. but you're right okay more and then uh, a TD tip that basically talks about why the digital clock is uh, much more preferred over the analog clock uh, it can be set more accurately it's usually quieter it doesn't have the continuous ticking uh, various things you know um, along those lines so yeah, it's good. Um, and then, of course, there is a rule that talks about analog clocks um, in case you're still using um, an analog clock. Um, clock should be set so that each unit will register at 6 o'clock um, and then you set next time control for 7 o'clock and 8 o'clock. And even if that requires um, a reset, say your second time control is sudden death 30, you would, you would after 40 moves, you'd stop the clock and at the 30 minutes um, so that the next time control falls at seven o'clock. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of analog clocks in, do you get many analog clocks at the big CCA events, Bob? I think it's less and less that we have seen them, but right. I don't, I haven't done, haven't really checked the percentage, but I don't think it's that big. Yep. And then uh, 16B2, which is uh, rule 16, you know, talks about clocks again. Um, and then it talks about digital clocks. So um, it, it talks about um, visual device used to indicate a player's time has been exhausted. So that means a flag, right? So you should be set um, so that someone can see a flag. And then uh, it says that you can include one or more, you know, um, such mechanisms may include one or more of a light, a display of all zeros or a display of a flag. Um, and then players really should explain the flag fall mechanism to their opponents. Um, I don't see that happening too often. Uh, I do see it every now and again that someone asks. Uh, it's usually the opponent asks, "How does the clock work? Is it you know is it set with a delay? You know various things along those lines." So the player will usually explain things at that stage. Um, you know most players I think are pretty familiar with how most clocks work nowadays. So especially at the high levels. So. And then uh, there's a TD tip uh, that's a, a new TD chip, I believe, Bob, right? Is that correct? Uh, that yes, it's from very, last month. Very recently, from May. And um, so this, this new TD tip talks about increment time controls and the original, the initial setting of the time. So if it's a game in 90 increment 30, um, actually move, you know, the, the initial time should be actually set as gaming 90 minutes, 30 seconds with an increment of 30 seconds per move. And some clocks actually do that themselves. And some clocks don't actually do that. Um, so it's, um, 
very much uh, on the clock right now. Um, I think we'd obviously like to see it standardized one way or the other. So this TD tip was uh, thrown in recently to, um, you know, as a way to let people know that yes, um, in theory, the increment, whatever that is, should actually be included in the initial time set for that clock. So like I said, you gave me nine increment 30, the clock should actually be 90 minutes plus 30 seconds, you know, 90 minutes and 30 seconds with an increment 30. And be careful that you don't add the 30 seconds if the clock already does it for you. <laughs> so this is gonna get very confusing. And then there's a the last little bit at the bottom here that says if a game um, has already started, oops. If a game is started without uh, the increment applied for move one, it is recommended that TD not allow the clock to subsequently be adjusted to add the increment for move one. So, um, yep. Uh, this failure to adjust the clock initially should not be allowed as grounds to contest it later time forfeit claim. So very important. Again, it's all part of a TD tip. It's not actually in the uh, rules, even though the TD tips are um, explanations of the rules, really. But uh, I, I know, you know, uh, it's, it's new to everyone. So um, are you going to go around and make sure the 30 seconds is added to or whatever the time control is added to all these clocks, Bob, at, at the start of a big CCA event? No, no, I think that would be very, they're just asking for confusion. But I think, you know, if somebody correctly requests the, the adjustment, then I think I would allow it because it's true that the increment is supposed to start from one. Yep. But I'm not a great fan of trying to, to do this because the problem is when we try to push this on the players and announce this because the thing is you would have to know for every single clock whether it added the time or not. And right. I know for some of them, but not for all. Yep, I, I hear you. All right, so let's move on real quickly. Uh, uh, and we, we wanted to add this in because players are unable to keep score. Um, so sometimes, uh, especially say lower level scholastics, um, you'll get this, um, or religious regions, um, you know, players are excused from keeping score or one half of the players uh, is excused from keeping score. Um, and so to compensate the, the player that is keeping score, basically some time is sometimes deducted from the player who's not keeping score since they're gonna save time by not having to do that. And then there's a little formula down here uh, at the bottom to, to, you know, to as a suggestion. Um, a good rule of thumb is to deduct 5% of the total game time allotted uh, up to 10 minutes from that player's clock uh, if they are excused from keeping score. So then you'll see some uh, very brief calculations there at the bottom that, um, shows what those calculations would add up to in various uh, situations uh, as examples. Uh, I think we have this at, uh, it's very interesting, we have this at some of the macro scholastics, I think, Bob. So, uh, the, the kids that want to keep scoring these very low level games are very intent on that five minutes or whatever being deducted off the, <laughs> off the other players' clock, yes. you know, so. Well, the thing, is, the thing is for these, for, for the, uh, Kids are, who are more or less beginning, keeping score is a very time-consuming thing. Yes. So if exactly. one's keeping score and one's not, that's actually a very big yep. difference. Right. Now, um, let's move on to the next one. So anyway, so you've got the clock and, and you've got it there. And there are some other um, stipulations here that's uh, situated in the rulebook. Uh, the director may require that clocks face a certain direction or that black or white sit on a particular side of the table. Uh, like at the National Scholastics, for instance, you know, we, we set all the boards up so that uh, black and white are sat on a specific side of the table. The clock is always on black's right and it faces some sort of center aisle so that the tournament directors can see all the clocks um, sort of at a glance if they've got good eyesight and can see all the way to the end of that row of tables. Um, so in the absence of any uh, sort of requirement, uh, unless black is late arriving for the start of the game, black uh, determines which side of the board the clock is on. Uh, but the interesting thing is that whoever arrives at the chessboard first um, can choose where to sit. And that's, that's actually in the clock rules, uh, talking about where, you know, which side of the chessboard a player would sit on. But um, so if you're ever looking for that rule, that's where it is, uh, exactly talking about where the clock 
is placed in brackets to decide where the clock was. Um, and then also, if black is lit for the start of a round, white makes the choice of equipment. Uh, so this rule is actually in 39, so we jump uh, a whole section of the rule book here. I think it talks about equipment uh, and clocks. Uh, if black is lit for the start of a round, white makes the choice of equipment. So white gets choice of set and clock. Um, oh. And then, unless announced or posted otherwise, white also may choose which side of the board the clock is on and which side of the board to sit on. So if black uh, doesn't arrive on time, then white basically gets to call all the shots. Black may not object unless white's equipment is non-standard or white has not complied with any special announced or posted stipulations, uh, in which case black's clock will continue to run. And the final decision is, uh, as usual, up to the TD if, uh, if there's any question about it. So... Um, I think there's some sound issues going on here. Can uh, I think people can hear. I'm having people say they can hear me but not you, or people can hear you and not me, so <laughs> we'll just live with it and, uh, and, and carry on. Motor on. Um, and then, of course, you get the interesting situation that if both players are lit, uh, the first to arrive must split the elapsed time before starting the opponent's clock. Uh, for and the example in, given in the rule book is if the first player to arrive is 40 minutes lit, the clock should be set to reflect 20 minutes of elapsed time on each side. Uh, and if that player who is the first to arrive fails to do this and instead sets the clock, then the setting stands, unless corrected by a director. I would hope the director is probably keeping an eye on those boards where there's no players and will get in there and take that 20 minutes off either side, otherwise the round might run 40 minutes late. And then uh, if the first late player to arrive sets the clock to give the opponent a disadvantage, like if, for instance, uh, the guy arrives and charges all 40 minutes to the opponent, um, then uh, the improper time shall be corrected and the player responsible for them penalized at the director's disc discretion. So, um, you know, so you, you don't want anyone getting away with anything. And then uh, it's... So we have this rule here, which is the US chess rule. Is CCA rule slightly different on this, Bob, or is this how CCA handles um, the, the time splitting? I think CCA is exactly the same, right? CCA is the same in the time splitting. Where it's different is in terms of how you claim time for it. Right. But we don't really get into that. Yeah, show. exactly. Yeah. So I think you have to wait the full hour or something, right? With CCA, whereas you do as chess, it's an hour. Well, yeah. Yeah. right. You have to you have to wait the time on the clock. But the point is, but if you have no clock, then you right. you know, it's, you know it's a, say it's forty and one hundred twenty minutes, and you come in with no clock, then you would have to wait the entire two hours for your opponent to show up. Right. Okay. DC. We'll get into that for in another, in another episode. Yeah. Exactly. And then uh, I, I love these two rules. Uh, so there's the, and this is in the rule book twice, by the way, uh, responsibility for setting the clock. Uh, players, not tournament directors, are responsible for knowing how to properly set their digital clock. Uh, if the player providing the clock cannot properly set the clock, the opponent may choose which legal clock is to be used. And then uh, we also have 16B2C, which says the players are responsible for knowing how to set their own clock. Um, players should be prepared to explain the clock's operation to the opponent before the start of the game. Um, this includes how to indicate a player has run out of time, how to pause both clocks if necessary to summon director, uh, etc. So I like this rule, um, but I think as a tournament director, you have some sort of um, responsibility at least to, to, to somewhat know how to set some of these clocks. I know when I was uh, chief of national scholastic events after the TD meeting, uh, I would make sure we had a, um, an array of clocks available where we would happily all learn how to set them together, etc. cetera. Um, makes the event run quicker uh, if you can do it. Uh, that way you know that the clocks are set correctly um, and, and things along those lines. But ultimately, it's not the tournament director's responsibility to set the clock. How many, how many clocks do you have to set at a CCA event on average, Bob? A whole bunch. <laughs> so... Uh... And, and it's not it was, just the first round, right? It's every round. Well, that's right. And the thing is, there's such a variety of clocks. I wish that there was some kind of standard for how you set a clock, but no, each clock has its own little way that you have to do things. Yep. Every, uh, every yes, 
so as Al Losoff is pointing out in the chat, if you've got Enrique Huerta there, um, Enrique, I think, knows how to set a, a bunch of clocks. And uh, yes, and David here is pointing out the CCA rule on setting clocks is find Harold Stenzel or Brian Yang. <laughs> or Bob, apparently. So I know when I, when I work for Boston Chess Congress for CCA, I, I end up setting a lot of clocks. Uh, but usually I encourage people to, to learn it themselves. Or at least try and set the preset so that next time they turn it on, it's set for the right time control. And then uh, starting the clock. So yes, there's a rule on starting the clock. Uh, the time determined for the start of the game after the bottom pieces are set up. And it's very important that the bottom pieces are set up. The clock of the player with the white pieces is started. And then during the game, each of the players having moved stops the player's clock and starts out of the opponent. So, yep. And then uh, if black is not present, so this means white is the only person there, uh, it says that they should start their own clock, make a move on the board, and then uh, start black's clock after they've made a move, obviously. So. And this clarifies that equipment is actually needed to start a clock. So if a player is running late, for instance, and they come there, they can't just set the clock up, start that running while they set up the boards and pieces. They must set up the board and the pieces first. So, um, you know, uh, this is, uh, seems very simple. Um, obviously, this is what Bob was alluding to earlier that, you know, if, if you don't have a clock or I guess if people don't have board and pieces, they, they can't really uh, start the clock count on, on that game. Uh -huh. So, and, and that's probably more important with CCA than it is with, um, with the US Chester. Uh, so that is the presentation on starting clocks. Bob, I think we, we ran through that in 20 minutes, um, which is, is probably a record for me uh, for now. So uh, there, was, there was probably more slides in there than there have been previous weeks, but I think maybe the, the content is hopefully a little sim simpler, but uh, I will say that the trivia is going to be a little more challenging. And, and Bob uh, definitely went out of his way to make sure this was the case. <laughs> I'm going to blame you, Bob. <laughs> so anyway, let's, uh, let's get the trivia rolling. Uh, as usual, you will type 1, 2, 3, or 4 in the chat uh, with your answers. So this is question 1. And uh, it, it's talking about time control of game in 6 to delay 5. And then, so white is actually late for the game. Black gets there, sets up the pieces, accidentally giving himself white, starts his own clock, makes a move, and starts the opponent's clock, as white should do. Uh, but then the player who's really meant to be white arrives after 20 minutes. And so what would you do? Would you, one, just continue the game with the reverse colors? Two, restart the game with the correct colors and reset the clock, if you're giving both the full... Um, uh, and then, sorry, divide the elapsed time between the two players, so they both start with 10 minutes less. So that means they both start game in 50, delay 5. Would you 3, restart the game with the correct colors, but make no adjustment to the clock? So white starts the game with 20 minutes left. Or would you 4, restart the game with the correct colors and reset the clock, so both players have the full game in 60, delay 5. And I'm sure as Bob might point out, I actually got this wrong in a, in a practical example in a real life example, which is probably where this question came from, just so Bob could really teach me how to do it correctly. <laughs> so we got we we got a partial answer. Someone's edging their bets with two or three. <laughs> uh, most of the answers seem to be three. Someone says two. All right, any more answers? Okay, do we have anyone else? <laughs> Good call, Alan. Alan Losoff says he prefers uh, answer three, but would have to look at the rules to see if number two is mandated. <laughs> I always check the rules. If you don't know the answer before you make a ruling, check the rule book. It's very simple. Oh, okay, let's let's uh, go ahead and uh, close this poll, and uh, we'll we'll uh, the the majority answer. Bob, two thirds of the people said three, 
uh, and a third of the people said two. Thankfully, nobody said one or four. Um, so what, um, what, what is the answer that we should be looking for, Bob? Well, the correct answer is three. There's, why it should start the game with 20 minutes less. The, the ruling we made at a recent tournament was number two, which is we split the time. That's a case where it turns out we didn't know the rule and should have got a rule book. But it's hard to know, but you don't know. Now, now we know it's the right rule. Right. So I think it was, is it rule 11F that says if the game is started with the colors reversed, then you restart the game, but you make no adjustment to the clock. And my theory on it was that if a player sits in the wrong place, then they have to show some sort of responsibility for doing that. And so I, I split the elapsed time. I went with number two uh, in an actual over-the-board ruling. Uh, and the players played, and, and so be it. But, uh, yeah, Bob was not comfortable with that. Went back and checked the rule book, found the rule, pointed it out to me, and hence I know better for the future. We all make mistakes. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's move on to question two. Another fun question. So let me uh, open up the, uh, the voting here for one, two, three, four. So the time control again is gaming six to delay five. Black is late for the game. White sets up his pieces and starts black clock without actually making a move. Uh, black arrives after 15 minutes and sees white has not made a move and claims he should not lose any time. What would you do? So would you one, make no adjustments to the clocks. Black starts with 15 minutes less. Would you two, add two minutes to Black's clock as a punishment to White for not actually making a move? So Black only starts with 13 minutes less. Uh, divide the elapsed time equally between the two players because of what White did. Uh, so both players start with seven and a half minutes. Or would you four, reset the clock so both players get the full game in 60, delay five? <laughs> We've got one voting so far, Ken Ballou. Chair of the Rules Committee here to keep an eye on us. All right, we're getting a couple more answers in. Everyone's following Ken Ballou's lead. Oh, we all know about the amateur team. He's, uh, <laughs> or maybe that's a different fiasco, but you know. <laughs> I know of amateur team East uh, stories, but that'll come up later. The one I'm thinking of. So, and I've actually seen this in practice. Um, and, and, you know, I, I actually went up to White and said, make a move. And White did. <laughs> right. And it would not happen at the National Open Open. That's for sure. Well, it might, but we'd fix it. I think the tournament director should just be allowed to go and make his own first move and then have White committed to whatever move that is. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead. Uh, only four people actually gave a vote there. What's, what's going on, people? Come on, hit, hit those numbers. We made it very simple. It's either one, two, three, or four. Okay, someone prefers two, but he's following suit with everyone else going with one. All right, let's close it off. Bob, what would you say the answer is? I believe the answer would be two, that... Um, it's a two-minute penalty, but um, Black would start with 13 minutes left. Right, so in the rulebook, it actually states that um, you, you um, White, in this case, may be penalized. I think it may be uh, penalized. Oh, that's right. I think you're right, given, actually. Given the standard penalty by 1C2A, which is two minutes to the opponent. Um, and so, in theory, the answer would be two. Um, but I, I um, one I think is full credit is for okay one as well. You know, uh, you get yeah. Right. But uh, according, and a, is it a TD tip? I think it's in a TD tip as well, where it states that um, what to happen in, in this particular instance. And of course, the best solution, like I've said, is to just ask White to make a move before Black even gets there, so that you don't even have this issue. Um, so, so uh, you know, just and I think that's also in the TD tip where it says White should, you know, you should just tell. Tell the player to make a move, uh, please. And it, it solves solves a lot of problems. Uh, so anyway, that's question two. 
Let's move on to question three. Uh, we're getting uh, we're getting questions are getting longer, so let's uh, open up the uh, open up the poll for this one. Uh, this time control is gaming thirty delay five. Black is late for the game. White sets up a pieces and clock with a bronze team delay. Starts her own clock, makes a move, and starts her opponent's clock. Black arrives after ten minutes and wants to substitute his own clock with a standard U.S. delay clock. Uh, what would you do? Would you one allow Black's request? Uh, Black has choice of equipment. Two. Allow Black's request because standard delay is preferred over Bronstein delay. 3. Deny Black's request. Black was late, so therefore forfeits the right to use his equipment. Or 4. Deny Black's request. Bronstein delay is equivalent to standard delay. So there's, there's two reasons for allowing the request and two reasons for denying the request. Which one would be uh, the most appropriate answer, I think? Is, uh... well, we definitely have a, a consensus on this one. Uh, consensus. Uh, a lot of people voting for. This might be. Uh, oh, we're not even getting any. It, it's probably four, but I might be three, or it, you know, it's probably four, but we should use one. Or yeah. <laughs> uh, Grant Owens option option five is uh, he would destroy any clock that has Bronstein delay on it. Oh, that's a shame. The new. Uh, I think the new uh, DGT 3000s or whatever they are also have Bronstein. <laughs> as well as US, regular US delay, of course. Ah, so now we've got some answers for three. So there we have a, a, a choice between three and four. So let's go ahead and close this one off. And uh, Bob, what, what, should our, what should we be looking for with this one? Well, I was originally thinking four is the right answer because Bronstein's equivalent standard and then I then I realized that actually three is also correct that black is late and therefore four fits the right because if black was there start of the game black black would have choice of equipment and could right. use his own clock so actually right. three or four are equally right yeah I think we determined three or four is is uh, an appropriate answer either way you're going to deny that request so whichever whichever way you want to go about wording it is is probably your you're fine with the rules for either of those reasons, uh, but you definitely deny in Black's request to, to use a, a standard delay clock over the Bronstein delay clock. They wanted to use that clock, get there on time. All right, let's move on to uh, question number four. And let's, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. let's do a couple of things here. Let's start taking the votes. Uh, the time control is gaming 90, increment 30. Uh, white is late for the game, so black sets up the pieces and starts white's clock. White arrives after 20 minutes and tells the tournament director 30 seconds should be added to each side so the players get the increment time for move one. What would you do? This was this TD tip we talked about earlier. So would you, one, do nothing, the game has already started. Two, add 30 seconds to both clocks. Three, add 30 seconds to both clocks and then add two additional minutes to white's clock to penalize black for incorrectly setting the clock. Or would you four reset the clock and set both clocks to gaming 80 with 30 seconds, increment 30, to split the elapsed time and add the 30 seconds for move one? So we've got some votes for three. And we've got some votes for, oh, we've got a vote for one and a vote for three. And we've got a vote for two. Wow, we're all over the shot in this one. <laughs> I'd be interested to know what reason you would have, Alan. Alan said one, but not for that specific reason. <laughs> okay, do we have any more votes before we close it up? Bob, these have been some very good trust, uh, testing questions here. Uh, I think the best way to learn some of this stuff is just by example. You, know, you ask a question, what would you do? It's much easier than reading the rules. All right, I'm going to close it off in five seconds. Any last votes? And no more brave souls. Okay, let's go ahead and close that one up.
Uh, so Bob, we had majority of people went for one. Uh, I think uh, a couple of people went for three. And then uh, at least one person went for, uh, two people went for two. Um, so this was this uh, new TD tip we were talking about that uh, I know you're not so keen on. But um, what, what would you say our answer should be? Well, I think it should be one because the game's already started. So you shouldn't, so if the TD tip says that once the game started that you wouldn't do it. Now, if you do number two and you add 30 seconds per clock, so now you have to be careful to know what kind of clock you've got and whether the clock has already added the increment. So the Kronos clock, say it was at the start of the game and, and a white wasn't played, then you could do this. If it's a Kronos, then, then you could add 30 seconds to both sides. But if it's a DGT, the clock's already added to 30 seconds. So you um, wouldn't because, want to do that again. Yeah, because white's the only clock that's been running, you might be able to see what black's clock is, is at. Um, and then, um, you know, go, go by that. But yes, it is tricky. So the TD tip says that, you know, you should get the 30 seconds for move one. So, um, you know, that. But it also says um, that the game is, if the game has already started, then um, it is recommended that you do not add, go back and add the 30 seconds. Um, likewise, you know, if the game is already well in progress, you, you know, that the missing 30 seconds cannot be used um, for any sort of claim uh, to do with them missing their time. So, um, but it is a TV tip, yes, not a exactly. rule. So it is a and TV it's a recommendation. Tip. So it was put in here, and it was put in recently, like last month. Uh, the TD tip, like we said earlier, um, goes over the fact that on increment time controls, the increment should be um, actually as part of move one for the uh, on the clock setting. So gaming 90 increment 30 would actually be set to gaming 90 30 seconds increment 30 to make sure that it's there for, for move one. Anyway, so that's question four. So... And then the last question, question five, um, which I'm, I'm assuming everyone's going to get this one right, but we'll see. Question five, let's open up the poll here. And uh, time control is 40, 90, sudden death 30, delay five, so two time controls. A player approaches and asks you to set their clock for them. What would you do? Uh, would you one, set the clock and ensure the move counter is active so the 30 minutes gets added after 40 moves? Would you two, set the clock without a move counter, so the nine minutes must be used up before the 30 minutes will be added? Three, tell the player it is their responsibility to set the clock, so not do anything. Or would you four, do any of the above? <laughs> and again, we're getting fine Brian Yang. I think Brian definitely knows how to set these clocks. But as a time director, you should know how to set them yourself, I, I think. Anyway. <laughs> So we are, we have various, various answers here. That's good. <laughs> okay. So let's, uh, yeah, so let's, let's close the poll off and, uh, it's good. It's good. So we actually got, um, we, we got multiple answers for four, uh, uh one answer for, um, uh, one, um, um, you know, uh, uh, two answers, I think, for one and three, and an answer for two as well, Bob. Um, what, which one do you prefer, Bob? Well, I think four is correct in terms of any of those would be acceptable. My preference would be two to set it without the move counter, just because of the fact that there have been disasters where players thought they made the time control and didn't, and they lost the game. And um, so... But I usually ask the player, do you want it with the move counter or without, and I give them the option. 
I would only choose three as far as telling the player it's their responsibility to set the clock. If it's a clock, I just have no idea how to set. And I just say, sorry, I, I can't set that clock. Right. And then explain to them they should bring their instructions, they should learn, whatever. Yeah. And I must admit, I've, I've used all I've used all four, actually. So at the big events, um, the, like the Sinkfield Cup, US Championship, etc., you don't expect to run into problems with the move counters. So we use one. Um, to, to give the extra 30 minutes as soon as 40 moves have been used. Um, and obviously, you, if you have the, the staffing to keep an eye on that, it makes life much easier. Um, predominantly, if I'm in a big weekend event, I'll set it to two. Um, so, um, you know, I'll set it without the move counter. The problem with that is I, you do get some questions um, when players have used 40, 40 moves and nothing happens to the clock. And they're a little you see them on edge about worried about letting the clock actually run out of time as to whether that means they're going to lose um, on time. But, um, you know, so it's, it's, there, there are some pros and cons for sure to, to setting it with or without move counter. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I can't really necessarily go with the golden rule that if they're um, more, experienced players or, or higher level players you should set it with the move counter because we, we've seen that's caused problems before um, we've had issues where clock accidentally gets pressed you know so the move counter is off so it adds to 30 minutes too early and then the player loses on time because they haven't actually made the 40 minute uh, 40 moves um, things along those lines there are, there are so many issues if that move counter gets off um, I've stepped into games to correct move counters that I've seen have been off according to, you know, the score sheets. Um, so, you know, to try and solve problems before they actually occur. Um, so, you know, I've, 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 seen, I've seen it both ways. Um, you know, I, I really detest using number three. Um, if I don't know how to set it, if there's someone else that has a clock uh, that's very similar or similar, um, you can ask, you know, one of the players, especially if it's before the round, to help you set the clock if they don't know how to do it. Um, so I've, you know, yes, any of those, any of those answers will suffice. Um, I find one and two are the most helpful answers to the players. Um, three is not very helpful. Uh, like I said, at big events, I usually set it to number two, you know, without the move counter. Um, and that way you resolve a lot of issues, but you create a couple of other issues on the other side. Uh, but at some of these other major events that I do, uh, where I think I'm not going to run into issues with the move counter, I'll happily set it with the move counter so that it automatically adds the 30 minutes at the time control. So, you know, and, and players players probably have their own preference too as to, to which one they, they set it for. So, and, uh, and that's perfectly fine if they do that. So, uh, Chris. I, yes. Any, any well, I wanted to point out um, a problem I've run into a couple of times with two using the DGT North American clock. Problem is not knowing what period the clock is. So we get people at the end of a, of a playing session and they swear up and down that they hit, you know, their, their flag's down. They're being forfeited. They swear up and down that they never got the extra 30 minutes. And unfortunately, I don't think there's an indication on that clock as to what period you're in. So we can, you can do a calculation based on when the round started to try to prove that, um, you know, no, they can't possibly have that 30 minutes. I think right. what might confuse them is either player goes down to, to zero, then both sides get an extra 30. So it could have happened when they weren't paying attention to the clock, something yeah. like that. Well, usually it shows a flag, right? I thought it would show a flag if it oh, goes to zeros. Well, that's right. The, the flag is a flag, and the player, will say, the, the player will say, but, but I, I have 30 minutes more, so why is my time up? Right. And you just uh, have to try to prove that yeah. they don't have the and I've also seen where you set number two that p players will, after 40 moves, come and ask you to add the 30 minutes. Um, you know, when it, that happens you know, all because the time. They've made the, yes. Because they've made 40 moves. Um, and you have to explain to them at that time, you know, well, you know, no, the 30 minutes will get added after someone's time actually runs out. You know, and it, it, it's a little hard to explain um, at times. But um, yeah, so I, I've seen that side of things too. Well, anything else we'd like to add? about the clock and starting games, Bob. I think that's, we've kind of covered it. Are there any questions in the chat? 
Uh, that I don't think there are any questions in the chat. I think one of the questions we got earlier was, should you set a clock with, without a, with or without a move counter? And since I knew the question was going to be coming up anyway. Um, and then one of the questions was, um, uh, Bronstein, is it okay to set with Bronstein instead of regular delay? And I think we answered that with trivia too. So I sort of ignored those questions at the time. And uh, seeing no further questions in the chat, I think we'll say that's it for this episode. So thank you very much, Bob, for joining us tonight and for providing us with your experience and uh, your, your TD and skills and for those wonderful uh, trivia questions. I, I should set the guest um, to, to set the trivia more often. So it, it's always fun to, to see what they come up with. And I even have to answer the questions myself for when we, <laughs> when we go over them. Sometimes even I get it wrong. So uh, hopefully not too often. But anyway, so thank you very much, Bob, for, for joining us. Uh, next week, we'll have uh, Harold Stenzel to talk to us, and we'll be going over Touch Move. So for now, thank you very much, and we'll see you all next week. Have a good evening.